So what I want to say to you, especially if you're a visitor and you haven't been before, is I do not stand here and nobody else stands here speaking to you as if we've got it right and we've got to tell you what you're doing wrong and therefore, and then you've got to get to where I am and then we're all going to be great. That's not the case. God is taking me on a journey. I'm messed up. I'm broken. And you know what? So are you. And that means we're in good company. And therefore, what God's taking me on, he can take you on. And that's why I'm here, because I'm going to share some stuff about what God takes me on, so he can take you on it. Is that right? And as I chat to some of you guys, because I get to chat to a lot of you guys through the week, do you know what I find out? I'm like, whoa, you guys are on the same journey as I am. Wow. Isn't that what God wants to do? That's called church. That's what church is meant to be, where we go on a journey together. So... Turn to the person next to you and say, what are you torn between? What are you torn between? I'll give you a few, some examples. I went on Google and I thought, I wonder what comes up when I type this stuff in. And, uh, oh look, there's my little picture I did. And it says... I'm torn between treat others how you want to be treated and treat others how they treat you. Or I'm torn between if it's meant to be, it will be, and if you want it, go get it. I'm torn between the one you love and the one that loves you. I'm torn between killing myself or killing everyone around me. I'm torn between the desire to improve the world and the desire to enjoy it. I'm torn between I don't need anyone and please fall in love with me. Who's, does that, anyone there? Sometimes like, I'm all right, I don't need anything. And then it's like, why won't someone just fall in love with me? We're torn between things. How about we take it into a place of, of bringing it into a, a faith I'm torn between religion and relationship. Everyone went quiet then. I'm torn between flesh and spirit. I'm torn between faith and doubt. I'm torn between worship and pop music. I couldn't think of a better word. Is that still a thing we use? Is, is that what we say? Do you say pop music still? Oh, that's all right. My daughter's saying yeah, so it's good. I'm still down with the kids. Torn between reading the word and watching TV. Oh, that hurts. I'm torn between what is easy and what is right. I'm torn between hearing truth and hearing what I want to hear. What are you torn between? Where are we at? There's a theme throughout the Bible. And I've noticed this a lot as, I, as God's been moving and as things have been happening. I've noticed there's a theme. And it's just like the spine of the whole of the word, the whole story of the creation of this world is there from the beginning and it will be there at the end. Anne touched on it a little bit last week. It starts with Adam and Eve. And it says that God walked in the garden, so we assume that God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve because he was walking around the garden and it says he was walking in the garden and he was like, where are you guys? So it sounds like that was a normal thing and they were hiding from him. So God was walking with them. They messed it up. But God's desire is that we would know his presence. Anne said last week about why did God create us? He didn't create us for his ego. He didn't create us because he needed us. He didn't create any of those things. There's no hidden agenda with what God did. He just wanted you to experience him. That's why he created you. That's Anne's message last week in a nutshell. He created you that you would know him. This is all about his presence. When you read the word of God, it starts with God creating us that we would know his presence. We mess that up, and then what God does is he says, right, 
I still want them to know my presence, but now it's going to be a little bit more complicated. So then he creates a, a, a system, a thing called a tabernacle. Tabernacle is known as a dwelling place. And so he set up a place that was like a tent where his presence dwelt. And different people had different roles within that. The tabernacle would have an outer court. It would have the holy place and the most holy place. Does anyone know what was between the holy place and the most holy place? A curtain, a veil, a thick curtain. Does anyone know who could go through the curtain? Who was it? The high priest. So they had priests and then they had high priests. I wonder, when we look at this picture, you've got a thing called the holy place and the most holy place, and there's a veil in between. I wonder if some of us are struggling with that. I wonder if we're struggling with, I'm happy in this, this place. The, the place, the holy place, was like a place of ceremony before you went into the holy of holies. I wonder if we're in the place where the ceremony is, is okay, but the other side of the curtain is not for us. I wonder, it was the high priest, I wonder if we rely on the pastors or the ministers of this world to, to give us the holy of holies, but that's them, that's their job. We'll stay here and you can give us, you go there and then you bring it back. I wonder if we're in that kind of place, between the holy place and the most holy place. When this was created, the tabernacle, just the end of a curtain, so a curtain, we have got a curtain, this is kind of a curtain, it's nothing like the curtain in the tabernacle, but just the end, other end of some fabric, is the awesome presence of God. And yet, you couldn't access it. Only the high priest could access it. You couldn't actually act. It's there, just through this thing, not that thick, just a thin piece of cloth, a thick piece of cloth, but you know what I mean? How thick can a piece of cloth be? And it's just the other side, the holy of holies, the presence of God, and yet, Access was denied. It was given to certain people. The power to change your life, the answers to our prayers, was the other side of a bit of cloth, and yet impossible to access. If you went in there and you weren't the right person, you drop dead. Aren't you thankful that there's not a curtain in the way this morning, today? Let's read some scripture. Matthew 27, 50 to 51. Jesus is on the cross. And it says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil or the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. And the rocks were split. Jesus. Jesus gives us access. Jesus has done something. That, that, that as he died on the cross, that veil was torn. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. There's a few scriptures here. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciousness have been sprinkled with Christ's 
blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Since we have a great high priest. Do you know church is messed up and is still messing up today because they have priests that tell you that they're the way into the curtain. They have to go through into these ways to allow, to give you what you need from God. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus got rid of that. Jesus says, I'll be the high priest. <coughs> I'll be the high priest. I need, actually need a bit of that water. The Lord provided. I'll be the high priest. I'll be that high priest. He is our high priest. We're not the high priests. We're priests. We're part of a priesthood. But he's the only way. Jesus says, I am the only way. There is no other way. We don't get to access it because of us. We don't get to access it because of what we do. We get to access it in Christ. <clears throat> Hebrews 6, 16 to 20. Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received a promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God, given both his promise and his oath, these two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we have fled to him for refuge, can have a great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest. Don't you love it? Don't you love the word? When we read it, sometimes you shout it, it's better. <laughs> He's our high priest. I love it. It says Jesus has already gone in there. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, it says, so then, and as I was preparing this yesterday, I was like, Matt, this is what we read on Wednesday. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I want to say to you that as God has been doing things in this church, it's really hit me hard how precious God's presence is. I, I think I grew up in a mentality that the presence of God was somewhere based around the, the Pentecostal movement. <clears throat> that the, the presence of God is somewhere linked to like the Holy Spirit doing some weird and wacky things with us. And he will. But the presence of God has got nothing to do with that. The presence of God is the plan of God from the start that we would get to dwell with God, tabernacle with God. This is the key. How do we turn up this morning? Praise was good this morning. Praise was great this morning. People were lifted. People, I'm not talking about the band, I'm talking about you guys. God's doing something in you, isn't he? Do you want to sing for joy this morning? Why? Maybe you've had a rubbish week. Why would we do that? Because he's done something in us. He saved us. He's worthy to be praised. <clears throat> we get to access his presence freely in Christ. We don't need to drum up anything. We don't need to hype anything. We wake up in the morning and we get to walk freely into the holy of holies. I am amazed by that. What about you? Do we live like that? God's presence is not just the Holy Spirit move or a flash of emotion or a moment we just have with God. This is where God wants you continuously. 
It's not about the gathering. It's about where you go, when you go. You take his presence with you. You dwell with God and he dwells with you. Whether you're driving in a car, whether you're at an office, whether you're in the toilet, whether you're in the, whatever is going on, that you're dwelling with God. You're spending time with him. This is what God is asking us for. He's already shown us how much he wants you. How much do we want him? I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus ripped the curtain. Jesus destroyed the system that was in existence. Jesus and only Jesus and only through Jesus do we get to enter the Holy of Holies. There's no other way. So I want to ask you a question. Think about this. When you feel far from God, when you're wondering, where's God's voice? When you're wondering that life's hard, what's God doing this to me for? When you're struggling, when it's not easy to access the presence of God, how about we stop asking God what he's doing? What about we stop blaming God? And what about if we look up, where's Jesus in our lives right now? If you're struggling to enter into the presence of God, think about this. Where's Jesus in your life? Because it ain't you that gets to access it. It's Christ in you. So where is Jesus in your life right now? And where is Jesus in your life when you struggle? I can't really get into it today. Where's Jesus? Because that access is available in him. Maybe the problem is, is Jesus has taken a, a back seat in your life. You've, you've put him to one side. It's not about him. It's not one way anymore. It's about your efforts, your energy, your time, what you can give. It's not got anything to do with any of that stuff. One way. One way. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your love. He doesn't need your effort. He doesn't need your energy. He doesn't need anything from you. But he gives you Jesus, and he says, one way. Why is it that we feel that we have to earn it? And then what happens is we build up all this stuff. Do you know what that's called? Religion, tradition, man-made rules that we create in ourselves. We can blame churches and systems, but we do it. All of us do it. You tore the veil. You made a way. When you said that it was done, guess what? It's done. Jesus doesn't have to do anything else. Jesus doesn't need to go and save you again. Jesus doesn't need to go and die on the cross for you again. It is finished. And he died on that cross, and the veil was torn so that you could access. But there's one condition. Just like there was one condition in the Garden of Eden. If you want fellowship with me, if you want to dwell in my presence, just don't do this one thing. Jesus comes along. If you want to dwell in the presence of my Father, you need to do one thing. You need me. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer me that lives, but he who lives in me. Where's Jesus in your life? We can say, God's, where's God? Ah, wrong question. Where's Jesus? 
Where's Jesus? You're not getting that access to God without him. Jesus says it very clearly over and over again. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Why did you think he ended up on the cross? Because people didn't like it. Because they like to get there themselves. What about you? What about you? It's all about his presence. But what I would say is, where does Jesus come into your life? Where is he? Is he this decision you made, like me, when you were 16? To have Jesus come into my life? Is he that far away? That distant? Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Question for yourself, that is. I sound like Yoda. Question for yourself, that is. Revelation. Just because God gives us the picture. God gives us the picture. He starts it off. He says, let's create man that they would know us. So he creates man and woman. Man and woman mess up, but God says, we still want them to know us. So let's build a system that's a bit complicated, but it's for a reason. So they create it. And then uh, they still mess it up. But then Jesus is on his way. And then Jesus comes along, and he, and he comes and dwells with man. Fully man, fully God. And he dwells with man, and, and then he changes the whole thing. And he says, right, the initial plan, we're going back to that, where we get to walk and have a relationship with our creation, and they would know us again. He tears the veil. He changes everything. The church begins. But it ain't over because there's a whole book all about it. And in Revelation it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold. Should we do that together? As if we're, we can pretend to be a loud voice from heaven. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Behold. Do you think it would be like that? The tabernacle of God is with men. The what? The tabernacle of God is with men. The presence of God. The, 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 God wants to dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Who's waiting for that day? There shall be no more death. No sorrow. No crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are true and faithful. Guess what? Guess what? Jesus is coming. And he's coming to what? Dwell with you guys. That you would know his presence. It's not even, we're, we're, we're getting to experience his presence right now, and it's not even the tip of the iceberg of what we're going to get. And yet, how awesome was it so far? It's not even over yet, is it? Dwelling in the presence of God. I want to just say to you that there is nothing stopping you accessing God except you. God's done it. Jesus has done it. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? How desperate are we for God? How desperate are we for God? How much do we want him more than anything else? How much does he take priority over everything else? And if he doesn't, what are you doing to change that? This title is a, said, what are you torn between? What are you torn between? You see, the presence of God is key. Jesus, the whole of the word of God is central around that. That's our goal. His presence. How do we get to dwell with God? How do we get to dwell with God more? How do we get to go further? How do we get to go deeper? It doesn't stop. We keep going and we keep seeking and we keep going deeper. God says you're going up to your ankles 
and then you go up into your knees, and then you go up into your waist, and then you start swimming. It doesn't stop. We keep going. We haven't arrived. You haven't got saved on a day, and it's all tick box and done. There's more. There's always more with God. If you want it, God's challenged me, and he challenged me over the last two years about what I was living like and how I was living, and I just, I, I had like a breakdown, really, a spiritual breakdown, where I was just like, God, I don't want to face you. I don't want to face you. And I give you this as my life. I don't want to, this, this story that I've got so far, I want more. I want to do more. I want to have stories of your faithfulness in my life that I could chat to you and Moses about when we get to heaven and whoever else there is. Moses would be like, oh, I parted the rest of you. I'd be like, Dying, you don't know what I met Mabel on number 23 and she, I prayed for her and she got healed and then she gave her heart to Jesus and you're chatting with Moses and I'm like, yeah, your Red Sea thing sounds okay, but you know, nothing compares to that. And like, don't you want those stories? Do you want to go to heaven with stories? I do. I'm not for the sake of it. Not like, right, I'm going to go find some stories now. I want God's stories. God lining it up. God making it happen. And it hit me and I was like, what am I doing? I love Jesus so much and yet I don't live like it. I'm not living like it. I'm not doing it how I know I should be doing it. I'm not surrendering how I should be surrendering. I'm not giving how I should be giving. I am not stepping out in the things that I need to be stepping out in. I need to change. And do you know where I have to go to change? His presence. Amen. His presence. What about you? What about you? I cannot emphasize enough how important your decision to follow Jesus is. It's the greatest decision you ever make, ever. There is no greater decision. You may get married, you may have kids, you may get a job that puts thousands and millions of pounds in your bank account. You may buy the car of your dreams. You may go to the holiday destination that you want to go to. They're all laughing at you, Rob. Um, <laughs> and nothing will compare to the day that you chose to follow Jesus. Nothing. Do you know what? We've got a lot of hang-ups, have we? Got a lot of baggage. Can I help you with some of that baggage? It's not like it's just going to go away, but I just want to help you with it. I just want you to think, because this might not be for everyone. This is for me. When I was 16, as people have heard my testimony, when I was 16, um, I gave my heart to Jesus. But my, my past leading into that point was one of neglect, abuse, uh, rejection, definitely lack of a father, then a replacement father that wasn't much better, in fact, way worse, you know, um, and, and all this kind of stuff. And I just, I don't know how, but God must have just had his hand on me. And who's got that kind of testimony where you look back and you think, God had his hand on me, I didn't even know it, yeah? That's what I've got. But as a 16-year-old kid, I remember I gave my heart to Jesus. I came into this place. People know the story, but about a year before, I, I, was, I was asking the question. Because something hit me hard, and that was death. And the world has no hope in death. It literally tells their children and their families that you were born probably as a mistake. That's what I was told. We didn't plan you. You were a mistake. And then, it's, and then it's like, you're going to, um, now you're going to live your life. You've got to get a job. You've got to do all these things. You've got to earn all this money. And you've got to have a house. And you've got to get a wife. And you've got to have kids. And you've got to pass it on to the next generation. And then you're going to die. I don't really get that. It doesn't sell anything to me. Like, you want me to work really hard my whole life. And then I'm going to die. Why would I want to do that? And yet, the whole world is doing that. With that understanding that there's no hope, and yet they're still doing it. And I, and I remember I was watching a, a something, and I, somebody died in the film, and I was just like, 
I was just like, I don't want to die. And I started crying. I was 15 years old. I don't want to die. I've only ever been told I'm a mistake. And then the scientist told me I'm a mistake because I come from some kind of bacteria. So that was a mistake. And then someone else has told me, um, and then I'm being battered and bruised from my life. And then I'm being told I've got to do this, this, and this to meet the mark. And that if I meet the mark, then, then maybe I'll have a, some resemblance of a decent life. And then guess what? You're going to die. And that's, and I'm like, is that all there is? And I remember praying without knowing it was a prayer and just saying, is there more than this? There must be more than this. There must be. I want to say to you, if you're in this place and you do not know Jesus, I'm telling you, he's the greatest decision you'll ever make. But what I want to say to you is when I reached that point and I made that decision, I had so much peace about my past. I had so much peace about my past. And I'll tell you why. Because I knew I had made the greatest decision I've ever made. I knew it. I was 16 years old. And everyone was like, what did you know about life? I knew enough. And I knew what emptiness was. I knew what the void was. I knew what, I knew what was lacking. And Jesus moved into the neighborhood. That's what it says. Jesus moves in to the neighborhood. God moves into the neighborhood, and that's what happened. God moved in. And I knew it. I knew from that moment, something's changed. Something's changed. That thing that I'm lacking, that fear of death has gone. That, that, that fear of, of the unknown is gone. But more than that, something has replaced it. Peace. God's love. And I want to say to you guys, I don't have hang-ups with my past. God brings stuff up for me to deal with at times. But I know that if that, and in fact, it did, if that journey was the journey that I had to go on to make the greatest decision I ever had to make, then it was worth it. There's no greater decision. No greater decision. And I want to say to you, what's your hang-ups? Because if the day you made, made the decision you made to follow Jesus, that those things led to that point, that day, it's worth it. God will heal you. He will restore you. He will do all those things. But how much do you really, really honor that salvation? How much does it really mean to you? I know that that day was the day everything changed. But from that day onwards, God continued to do the work. The journey, which I spoke about at the beginning. I want to encourage you this morning that if you've made that decision, but the past is still a mess and still conquering you and owning you and is in your head 24-7, I want to say, look at where it led you to. Look at where it led you to. Look at it. Because if it led to the day you met, met, met Jesus... If it led to the day that you met Jesus, if it led to that day, then it's worth it. It's worth it. It's not easy to say that. I went through stuff. It's not easy. But how much is that decision, how big is it in your life? How big is it in your life? Because it should be. What are you torn between? I'm going to finish with this. We gave all those things. Oh, I'm torn between this. I'm torn between that. Well, this is what the word of God says we should be torn between. Are you ready? Because I wasn't when I read it. Philippians 1, 20 to 26. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. This is Paul. I'm torn. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go to be with Christ, which would be by far the best thing for me to do. 
but for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help you all, help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he's doing through me. I was reading this, I was thinking, I want that read out of my funeral. I want that read out of my funeral. Not because I think I deserve it now. I want to get there. Don't you? Don't you want to get to the point where you're torn between not what to watch on telly, not what to eat, but torn between the desire to be with Christ in heaven and to continue or to continue with that awesome passion that he's put in your life for his gospel that you would be used by him and that you want to be used by God to change lives to turn situations around to help plug people out of the pit that they're in and that that would be equally as a desire for you as it would be to even be in heaven. Paul's like, it's much better for me to be sat with Jesus right now, but I'm torn between these two things. What about you? What about you? I'm, we go through life. There's stuff that we have to deal with. I get it. But where does Jesus come into that? Where does he come into it? Are we torn between those kinds of things? Or, or actually, are we torn between things that we think, why am I even worrying about this stuff and thinking about this stuff? If I just had those two things right, I probably wouldn't be worrying too much about the other stuff. God's presence. <sighs> torn between just absolute eternity with Christ right now and an absolute passion to remain because you just want to reach one more. You just want to change another's life. You just want someone else to know Jesus. A few months back, well, actually quite a while back, we talked about end time stuff and um, we looked at like um, a moment that was going on around things that we were studying. And I remember at the time, a lot of people were really excited that potentially Jesus could come back. And my heart was so heavy because I knew my life was not what I wanted to take to heaven with me. I knew it. I was like, God, I, like, I want to see you and I'd really like to be rescued from this world right now. I don't want to go up with this CV. I was, and I, I was so thankful when nothing happened. You know, where, where, where it kind of like, I thought, thank you, God. I got a chance. I've got a chance to live a life like Paul is saying here. This isn't somebody making stuff up. This isn't just, this is the word of God. And this is Paul talking. And he's saying, for I fully expect and I hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. I want to challenge you this morning. If you were to die right now, what are you taking with you? What are you taking with you? Because you can't take your materialism. You can't take your relationships. You can't take your money. You can't take your work CV. You can't take your blue sports car. You can only go up to God and he'll say, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what I gave you? Turn to the person next to you and say, what are you torn between? Can I have the worship team, please?